Beyond the Wrench with Jay Gunnan from Find the Wrench. On today's episode, it's a little bit of an interesting one. This is a, this is kind of a fun episode to have as we conclude 2021. Uh, this actually is an extension of some podcasts that we've done in the past. So I get to welcome now recurring guests, Tanner Brandt and Matt Fonslow. How are you guys today? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. And so the point of this podcast was one that Tanner had brought to my attention uh, we, I think, Tanner, on the podcast that we had done on Beyond the Wrench before, you had mentioned that you had five misdiagnosed vehicles at one point over the course of a year and that you documented them. Yep, that was for last year, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, Carolyn Cocolette from Shopware in our podcast had said, I forget what she said. It was something along the lines of like, she was really impressed and she wanted to know what those were, right? She she called me out and said that she thought that there was more than that. That's what she did. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so we, we brought uh, Tanner and Matt together today to uh, look through what Tanner misdiagnosed in 2021. And uh, the first six hour podcast ever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I guess I should preface this real fast. Also, she uh, called Matt and I uh, some of the best diagnostic technicians that she knew. Little did she know that that was uh, incorrect. Matt and I know people that are much better than us. And to prove that, we're going to go over the things that we have misdiagnosed as to have, so that people don't think we're really that great. Well, and I, I think it's interesting because even before we hit record, Matt was bringing up a, a, a time when one of the best learning opportunities that he had or the best instructors that he had heard had talked about a time where maybe they didn't go the right path. Right, Matt? Yeah, it's... Uh... You know, I don't think the details are all that important, but he presented at um, a, a big training uh, expo, and in his presentation, he showed how he really went the wrong direction with a repair. He properly diagnosed it, but the repair portion, he went uh, above and beyond trying to fix this. And I suppose you could argue as backyard it because, um, you know, he wasn't aware of some information that he found afterwards. So he basically presents this as, you know, look, I, I went the wrong direction too and misdiagnosed or chose the wrong path of repair. And if I would have just looked here, which if you ask people, if you sit them down and say, hey, what is the, a, a good, you know, step-by-step -step process? You know, what's a good strategy based diagnostic process, everybody would probably say, you know, verify the concern, talk to the customer and search technical service bulletins. But then they get in the bay and they don't always follow that. That isn't real world. So they skip steps based on whatever experience, probabilities, blah, blah, blah. And he did that and it burnt them. And he puts it in this presentation. It's great. It's great because it's real. The response in the uh, feedback forms was very negative that he essentially wasted their time on this presentation. And if he would have just looked up service bulletins, you know, everybody knows to look up service bulletins. And so he just doesn't present there anymore. And, you know, it's like, wow, you guys finally got an honest instructor. It isn't like the typical instructor up there where they know all, see all, they don't get burned by anything. All you see is success story after success story and super complex uh, diagnostics done in, you know, you don't even know how much time, you know, for all you know, it was an hour, two at the most. And uh, you finally get an honest presenter and what do you do? <laughs> Run them out on a rail. <laughs> Little do they know that the misdiagnosis or the uh, incorrect repair, now they all know that even if it doesn't have to do with the diagnosis portion, but it has to do with the repair portion, that they're going to look at the service bolt and see what the repair is to make sure that they do it correctly and they don't waste time. So they don't realize that that's something they learned. And now uh, in the back of their mind, what would it be called when they're 
uh, I guess their unconscious brain when they do something, they're going to look at the repair side of it, go through the service bulletin and look and see what the fix is because they saw that in a class. And they're not going to realize that they actually learned it. So sometimes mistakes are, you may not think of the mistake as a learning experience or the mistake that somebody shows you as a learning experience, but in the back of your mind, you're like, oh, I need to check, you know, the rest of the service bulletin, or I need to look and see how it's repaired first because of that, but you don't realize that that's where it came from. Well, but how much value is there in being a little uh, transparent and, and being a little vulnerable, uh, I think that's the word I'm looking for, yep. to students, right? And this could go for a high school instructor, tech school instructor, a factory instructor, whoever it is. If you can say, hey, you know what? We don't know everything. Uh, like there are times where the process doesn't work out the way that we thought it would. And you got to think on your feet a little bit to be able to, to figure this out. You know, I think there's so many times where, especially young techs, it feels like they come in and are assumed to know everything and maybe they can follow a process. But when it comes to really that, you know, that scrapping to figure out what it is that's wrong with something, if they've been programmed to just fit in this box all the time, I don't think that's the best diagnostic procedure or, or process. Uh, and when you have to go outside that box, people get lost, right? Yeah, and, and I don't want to like interrupt Tanner with this, but when you say that, the thing that really jumps in my mind is something Michael Jordan said a long time ago. Not, well, I guess depending on who you ask, a long time ago, <laughs> <clears throat> depending on how old you are. Uh, but a while ago, he said something, and I, I looked up the quote just so I get it right. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career, I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. And I think what you're saying is important simply because when you're being presented to, and it's not just presented a, a, a diagnostic class or whatever the class is, it doesn't matter what it is. When you're presented and you have this idea of what they're doing is perfection that you now set up a false standard for yourself. And I'm not saying you're supposed to be super accepting of all your screw ups, but they're going to happen. They have to happen statistically, no matter what, it's going to happen. How are you gonna handle it? And here you have somebody that is known to hit game winning shots. Magic Johnson, or not really, Magic maybe a little bit, but Larry Bird, Michael Jordan, they were well known as they were, they were killers, man. Stone cold killers at the end of a game to win it. There was people you did not want to have the ball at the end of a game to win it. And those Larry Bird and Magic or Michael Jordan were two that you just didn't want. But they missed a lot. You don't talk about that. Well, same thing with up in the uh, front of the classroom. Not saying that every you know case study you put up there has to be all the screw ups, because that you know, but you, there's a human element that probably should be conveyed as well that oh by the way yeah the last five we, i glossed over some stuff just because you know we don't need to focus on the mistakes but here's one i'm just going to show it raw and uh, i i think there's value to that there's a lot of value in that so that you don't set these unrealistic standards for yourself of just never making a mistake you should strive for it yeah yeah i mean look at the youtube videos think about <laughs> I th when you watch a YouTube video and somebody goes through their diagnostic process and they start walking you through step by step how they found it, but you realize that the clamps are loose, like they're taking stuff apart because they're going back in and retaping what they did. They don't say that it took them two hours and they went down the wrong path in the beginning. Once they figured it out, then they made the video to make the video short and also show the diagnostic process. But knowing why they went down the rabbit holes or knowing what steps they took first may help. And I look at a perfect example of making a mistake and how it has helped the industry. Uh, Matt and I are good friends with George and Carlos Menchu that own AES Wave, the U-Scope. The U-Scope has a very uh, pertinent warning on it now that specifically states, do not plug it into a wall socket. <laughs> that warning never would have been there if it wasn't for Brandon Steckler making a mistake with the very first prototype. So now, Everybody benefits from a mistake that was made so that nobody ruins a use scope so long as they read the directions. The lesson there is just never have this stuff sent to your house. 
Yeah. Especially <laughs> don't let it arrive on a Friday. Yeah. Because you're going to get home and then you're next to it for a whole weekend and you got to, I got to hook it up to something. Well, there's the outlet. <laughs> <laughs> a I lot happen. of picoscopes that got sent back with blown <laughs> <laughs> channels. I happen to have another uh, prototype device currently right now from uh, AES Wave, and that was a joke. I said, <laughs> they said, have you broke or had any issues? And I said, no, but I haven't plugged into a wall <laughs> yet either. <laughs> so I said, I can try if we want to, but, you know. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, I, th I, I think overall it's it's nice to show – that even even guys like you that have been doing it for uh, forever and are really good at it will occasionally make a mistake, right? And I think it's something where you learn from. And and for me, I think the older I get, the more I feel like it's important to understand how things work and like how how you know if if you're taking it apart, if you're just going through the diagnostic process, a lot of times you might not truly fully understand like, okay, I know how this thing works, but like being able to, to maybe make a mistake and, and have to go down a different route than maybe you would have traditionally. Uh, I think it helps just make you a smarter person and helps you with diagnostics moving forward. Hopefully that's a cheap mistake. Uh, I know coming out of tech school, I was terrified of, of frying a controller. Uh, and it was because I had my dad and all of every instructor I ever had say, if you fry this, it's going to cost you a thousand bucks or whatever. And I'm like, no, I, the, the last thing I'm going to do is try to screw that up. So I, uh, I think showing that there's real humans that can be really, really good at this is really important. I would say the strongest diagnosticians I know still make mistakes. Like if, if you just took every step by step that they did to lead them, lead to this diagnosis or this um, uh, the diagnostic decision, whatever it may be, that if you really pulled it apart, there's a bunch of mistakes, okay? And it's not being critical, it's just the way it is. But what I think the difference is between, you know, that top, Whatever, whatever number we want to assign, it's probably bogus anyways, but 10%, 1%, whatever. That, that top tier group of diagnosticians, they make the mistakes, but the difference I think is they don't go down that rabbit hole nearly as long or as far. Like mm -hmm. they recognize that, nope, 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 this can't be it. Back up, take the other you know direction, or let me rethink what the result is or what this result is telling me and go back this way where the either less knowledgeable, less experienced, you know, whatever, less lucky, they continue down that rabbit hole and just get more and more decisions based off of a, a bad branch of this diagnostic tree. And um, that I, so I think mistakes are made. They just don't stay on that bad path as long as a weaker diagnostician. Yeah. I think a oh go ahead. Oh, go Tanner. ahead. No, you go ahead, Tanner. Okay. I think that a lot of that too sometimes has to be has to do with that as you get better, you seem to also become more humble in knowing in like telling yourself, I don't know enough about this scenario at this point. So I'm going to stop and I'm going to go back instead of going, I know this is the way it works because I watched whatever and I know that this is the way the circuit works and then you go down you know, the rabbit hole and that's not the way the circuit works where once you get really good and you've been burned, I should preface this, when you get really good it's because you've been burned a lot of times from misdiagnosing stuff and you've just done a lot of it throughout your career. So you realize and you, okay, I don't know enough about this, so I need to call or ask somebody that does or go, you know, search and service information, or if it's not there, go to an SAE document or something of that. And I think for Matt and I do something that was kind of, I would say, unique to us and, uh, I don't know, a dozen others was uh, IETN chat at night. I mean, uh, Harv definitely beat me enough as I <laughs> beat me up enough when I was like, I don't know, 16, 17 when I was on there. And so you would go, you know, at the end of the day, you'd go and talk with all these guys that were just really, really brilliant. And you'd talk about the stuff that you did and they'd be like, why'd you do it this way? There's a better way. So you got kind of beat up early on in life and we're like, 
yeah, I definitely don't know as much as I do. So then I just kind of preface my career of if I start down the rabbit hole and I don't actually know, I need to figure out how the circuit works, whether that's more information or hooking up a scope to it and figuring out doing some testing that has nothing to do with what I'm actually trying to diagnose and just trying to figure out how something works. And I think when you're, you know, early on in your career or you're somebody that I guess doesn't have that, I don't want to say they're not humble, but doesn't like, thinks that they know, I guess, more about the circuit than what they do or more about the um, car that they're working on or the system that they're working on may not take the time to go and figure that out because they just make the assumption that they know instead of that they don't know. Yeah. And that's where experience sometimes can burn you. Yeah. Sometimes I get burned by experience, like, <laughs> like having it. Like, case in point, um, a Volkswagen uh, setting lean codes and uh, idle rough. So what the first thing you do is you check crankcase vacuum. Yep. And this thing had a lot. So I thought, I yep. mean, I'm not used to them having very much. Maybe, I don't know, a quarter PSI maybe, you know, or... Or not even that, not a quarter PSI, but uh, well, no, like seven, in, yeah, seven inches of water, eight inches of water. Yeah, no, certainly no more than 14 inches of water on a manometer. This thing had almost an, an inch of mercury, like it was significant. Uh, and and so I called the uh valve cover, right? Yeah, the yep. CCB in it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was very confident in that diagnosis. Put the new one on, same thing. <laughs> Little bit of digging. I think Diagnostic Network has a very nice uh, growing chart spreadsheet of people logging in known goods. And sure as heck, guess what? My readings yeah. were completely normal. Yeah. So I had to buy a valve cover. <laughs> it, it I did get it for cost, but still, it sucked. Like, yeah. And, and that comes from like, so what Matt's talking about with the CCV, like that's a very common fault on Volkswagen. So anytime, like Matt was saying, we get a lean code with rough running on a Volkswagen, you're like, yeah, it's going to need a valve cover. But then you have guys like uh, Hans Jorgensen, and I don't remember the other person that started that library, but there's two people. Hans is one of them, and whoever the other person was, I apologize, I don't remember. But that's where the known goods are, and like, I'll text Hans and I'll be like, hey, what are your thoughts of this? And he's like, yeah, that's fine. He's like, just refer to that chart I made. So you know, those guys are, and he specializes in Volkswagen. So, and Hans is also phenomenal about known goods, whether it be uh, scope captures or these crankcase captures of knowing what they should have. But like Matt said, you know, we assume that we're like, yeah, we've seen this a million times and not going through and, finishing testing things. I have one of my case studies we're going to talk about where I was just like, yeah, I've tested far enough and I was kind of in a hurry and that bit me. <laughs> so. Well, that's that's a good segue. And I think going into this conversation and talking about where Tanner screwed up this year uh, is a fascinating conversation because Matt and I just get to, to poke fun at Tanner for the next 45 minutes. So this is, this is a a true delight in my that, in my field here, right? One of my very favorite activities. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everybody's favorite pastime. So we'll do like, uh, should we do like Letterman style uh, top ten or what? First off, how many misdiagnostics uh, or I, I don't even know is it just misdiagnostic or is it a uh, mixture of repair? What what do you got here? Um, misdiagnosis and then. Uh, one that I did not technically misdiagnose, but I walked away from because I couldn't come up with a good way to test it. Um, and I did end up diagnosing it correctly once I came up with the rest of the information from the customer, but there was no good way that I had to diagnose it. So um, from January 1st to now, there's three total on the list. Damn you. <laughs> Damn you. That So three. So this podcast is actually only going to go probably like a half an hour. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, it just buzz through them. So let let's talk about the three. What 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 three did you have? Okay, so first one, uh, 05 Chevy Silverado thirty five hundred Duramax, 
and it was a crank no start. What I did wrong on this one, uh, when I started looking at it, the injectors were not being turned on with the Fickum. A uh, little bit of backstory on this one was it had sat in a field for a long time. And it was at one of my shops, so I don't deal with any customers for those listening to this that don't know me. Uh, I only deal with shops. I own a mobile diagnostic and programming company. So I only get the backstory if the customer has filled in the shop. So this one was, it was a construction truck that had not been used in a couple of years in that field and they pulled it out and wanted to get it going. Uh, so when I looked at it, it was not turning the injectors on and I did not know a whole lot about this year Duramax, it's an 05, it's older. And I just went to it and said, okay, we are not powering on the injectors per the FICM. We had no power going to the injectors at all. It goes directly to the FICM, tested all my powers and grounds to the FICM, everything was fine. And then was just like, okay, cool, it needs a FICM. And that FICM was like 800 and some dollars, put a FICM on it, same exact problem. <laughs> oh. So it was an expensive mistake. What I didn't know was the shop had a injector disconnected. They had unplugged one injector. And I should actually say, I did know the shop had an injector disconnected. What I did not know is if you unplug any injector on those vehicles, it shuts down all of the injectors when you unplug it. And my assumption is I really never dug too deep into it. Uh, it sends 50 volts out to the injectors. So it basically wants to protect itself. So once he created a fault, it shut everything down and that was the end of it. Uh, once I realized that he put the new fix in it and it didn't fix it, I went back out. Then of course I went on reading and I think that's actually on Diagnostic Network where I found somebody was talking about it, uh, that if you unplug it, you'll have you know strange issues like this, that it shuts everything down. So I when I went back out there to look at it, I'm like, everything has to be plugged in on this truck. I don't care what's disconnected, every single thing on it, we need to reconnect and see what codes we have at that point. And once everything was connected and I cleared the codes out of it, then it started firing the injectors again. So I, of course, plugged the old FICM back in, do the same thing, clear all the codes out of it. Now we have power to the injectors like I should have in the beginning. And I realized, okay, this, we actually have some other issue with it. So I went further and checked the uh, return flow rates and return flow rates were high. Uh, we actually figured out that this truck had at some point had gas put in it and then it sat out in the field with gas in the injectors. Those of you that have dealt with a uh, scenario with old gas know that it gums up everything. So it had gummed up the diesel injectors and in the diesel world, that's not a thing. You shouldn't have eight injectors that are bad, like that never happens. But that's what was wrong with this truck because it had eight bad injectors because it had gas in it. Well, when we took the, basically I realized we had high return flow rates and was like, yeah, this needs injectors. I have no rhyme or reason why eight of them are bad until he pulled them out and called me. And he's like, these things smell like just straight up bad gas. I called the customer. Customer still wasn't like, open he's like oh yeah maybe before we <laughs> parked it it might have got gas burned. so i'm like well now we're really you know screwed if this doesn't fix it because now we're in eight injectors plus he was able to return the ficum he returned the ficum and bought injectors from the same company so that they were cool about that but so yeah so i screwed up um in my opinion by not reading service information and just kind of making an assumption <laughs> Well, so so for those non-technical people out there listening, FICM is fuel injection control module, right? Yep. yep. And so that's what's supplying. That's the brains. And was this was this a common rail system, or how does was it like? So if one injector was unplugged, I'm assuming like you you interrupt the circuit, which is then it just turns everything off. It, basically, it's a safety, um, which is what's weird with this. Normally, you would just unplug an injector, and it should just like misfire on that cylinder it shouldn't shut everything down right um, but basically when it sees now on like a chrysler i guess for example if you disconnect an injector it shuts off the computer's ability to drive that injector once it sees a misfire it stops trying to fire it so it'll just do one at a time where with this thing i had checked multiple injectors and none of them had power going to them and from my understanding come to find out it's because if you disconnect one it's 50 volts it's 
its concern and then it just shuts everything off when it sees an open circuit. Now, if it sees like a fault with an injector or something like that, it may not turn them off. But once it saw an open circuit, that was it. What what was the first cause of concern? Like that they even unplugged the injector in the first place? Like were they? Uh, they were looking to see if it had signal to it also, which is another, I guess, thing that I look at the way I do testing, typically I leave stuff plugged in. Um, a lot of guys will unplug an injector and plug a noid light in. That's kind of like the old way of doing stuff. I leave things plugged in and check it. They had unplugged it. I didn't think anything about it. I just assumed that it would kill, you know, that one injector. Um, and then the rest of the stuff or the rest of the injectors would be fine. So I didn't consider what they had done would screw up my testing. Um, Matt would have probably tested this completely differently. This is the other thing is that none of us test things the same. You can put, you know, 10 of us in a room, every one of us is going to check something differently or in a different way. Yeah. How, right. Based on experience or, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So the couple, what are the lessons learned out of it? One, this, this, you didn't get the full story up front, right? Like that yep. was, and that wasn't all on you. Like that was, that was hard. Like, especially if you're third, you know, if you're third down the line to get the straight story, it's like playing the telephone through the, the cups, like trying to get the right message all the way through. Uh, it, it's hard to, it's hard to really know what you're playing with at that point, isn't it? Yeah. So first thing for me is at this point, uh, I should have gotten the whole story. Secondly, I should have uh, called somebody instead of just making the assumption that, you know, not giving power to the injectors was a fickum. I should have done more research or called somebody that worked on them regularly uh, that would have known that right off the top of their head. I could have made a phone call and said, you know, is this normal? Is there something? And they'd have been like, is there anything unplugged? And are there any codes in it? So that would have saved $800. It was, you know, again, one of those days I was kind of in a hurry. The shop is an hour and a half away from here. Um, so he's on the outskirts of my territory anyways. I was there programming something and it was a, hey, while well, you're here, quick look at this. And I didn't really have time. So I rushed through it and, you know, that's what happened. Matt, what would you have done differently? I mean, I got a level with you. Probably not. Uh, probably not anything. It. <laughs> See, I'm worried. I'm I'm tainted on it because I think I read the article. So now I'm aware uh, the article on diagnostic network. So I think I was aware of they have to be plugged in, and it seems like I've run into that before with not an unplugged injector, but an open circuited injector that caused. I mean, some seriously weird things. So I, I just, I can't honestly say I would have approached it differently other than being tainted with not, you know, having the advantage of knowledge of something uh, like that being unplugged uh, to send me a little quicker. Let me ask the both of you a question. For those technicians that are out there listening, do you have any advice for them on how to get the whole story? I think oftentimes that's one of the hardest parts, right? Is to get the the whole story of you know from a customer as to what actually happened prior to you touching it. Do you have any advice for those technicians out there listening? I have gotten to the point where I don't care anymore, and I don't want to sound like just you know grizzled. Get off my lawn! Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. want to sound like just that grizzled veteran who's jaded and all that it's just i finally got fed up with me and jerked around and they're never going to tell me the whole story yeah and sometimes in their defense sometimes it doesn't really ever occur to them either like oh you know what you're right the battery was dead my neighbor he used to be a mechanic he tried to jump it that's when this started acting up yeah that yeah. seems like that would be something obvious to mention no no never never even I occurred to them until you call up with the repair and say, was this thing jump backwards or? Yeah. Uh... <laughs> yeah. I, I've gotten to a point where um, I, if it's something that I am like stumped on, I'll just ask for the customer's phone number. Uh, sometimes the customer doesn't know that I am there working on it. And then I have like questions that I'll ask them and I'm going to jump into the next one because it is perfect for this topic Love um, it. and i had to call the customer on this one to figure it out so this is the one that i 
did not technically misdiagnose, I walked away from because I couldn't come up with a game plan on it. Uh, 2013 Ford Explorer, it was a no crank, no start, nothing on the dash came on, the start stop button did not work, it had no communication to any um, module other than I think it was the PCM when I first got there that I could communicate with that. Uh, and that will communicate with the start stop button off so you can go into it and see what's going on with it. Um, basically, when I got involved with this, the car had broke down in Georgia and they were from Pennsylvania. They had driven to Georgia to visit their uh, child that was in college, or I should say child, their teenager that was in college. And it broke down and then they just started jumping it from shop to shop trying to make it back to Pennsylvania. So it had made it like three and a half hours north of Georgia to where I live in South Carolina. That's a nerve wracking um, ride. Yeah. By the time that, <laughs> well, so I, what I mean by jump from place to place, AAA had towed it down in Georgia. They looked at it. They didn't know what to do with it. It was towed to another shop a little bit further north. It just kept taking tow truck rides further north with the intent that eventually it would just tow its way to Pennsylvania, I guess. Um, so by the time I got it, everybody had messed with it. And then the shop that had it when I was looking at it had put a BCM in it thinking that that was what was wrong with it. And one of the things that happens with new vehicles is if you start changing modules and you have a communication issue and the module is not it, you create further issues because now you have an unprogrammed module that not only can you not communicate to, but it's not going to turn on systems like it's supposed to because it's not programmed. So they had switched the BCM and then I couldn't communicate with everything or with anything. Had they left the old BCM in it, I would have been able to communicate with the old BCM, which is one of the steps we ended up taking to kind of get an idea of where to go. So they sort of created like more of an issue. Um, but what ended up going on with this that really threw me for a loop was once we got the old BCM in it and I could communicate with them that also and look at some of the PIDs, I realized that the start stop button was not doing anything. Well, looking down in the start stop button, I realized there was a bunch of splices in it for a remote start. So of course I, you know, pull that out now and I'm looking at the wiring and they had uh, crimped a butt connector over insulation. So I took that out and fixed that. Now the start stop button was actually doing something and would read when you hit it that you were pressing it. So originally it wouldn't. But the problem was that that had came after their original issue. Some shop had been, saw the remote start in it and then had cut it out and put a butt connector in it. So that issue was created after their original issue. So once I fixed that, now the start stop button at least registers that it's being pushed, but the car still doesn't do anything. <laughs> so now I'm like, involved in this and I was literally there to program a BCM, but I couldn't communicate with it. So now I'm like stuck messing with a car I shouldn't be messing with anyways. So at that point I was like, I'm done with this. I'm not here to diagnose that you called me to program the BCM. It doesn't need a BCM. I fixed your start stop button. I'm leaving. It's up to you guys to mess with it. So they of course called back and they're like, we don't know what to do. We'll pay to diagnose it. So I go back out and I start trying to look at this car. It's a 13 Explorer. It has like, I don't know, 30 modules on it in several different uh, communication buses, high speed and medium speed and low speed. And the high speed and medium speed buses were both down, which is why I couldn't communicate with anything other than the PCM. And when I communication network, the way to do it is you divide the network up and you just basically take splice packs out and you try to hook up a couple things on the network and see if you can get communication and you're going to remove one module at a time. It's a divide and conquer method when we teach it in a class. So that was my plan until I realized that every splice pack was behind the dash that I couldn't get to. There was one splice pack I could get to for high speed and I couldn't get to any of the others. So anybody from Ford listening to this, that was a terrible idea. At least normally <laughs> when you put a splice pack, like GM will put splice packs under the seat. You just quick pull it out, even on like a Cadillac. And so once I realized they were literally all behind the radio and like I had opened the debt or opened the glove box and I could see some of them, but I couldn't get to them. And I had to move the radio and I still couldn't get to them. Some of them were behind the HVAC box. 
So I'm like, well, obviously I'm not going to diagnose this, you know, in that order, in that way. So at that point, I'm like, I don't even know what to do to this thing because I can't do anything without taking the dash out. And I didn't want to spend any more time on it. So I just told the shop, I says, look, I don't want to mess with this anymore. Like, I don't know what to tell you. You, you know, you're on your own. <laughs> have fun. Have a nice day. I'm leaving. So that's what I did. And of course, now the customer's sad because their vehicle is still stranded. They had gone back to Pennsylvania at this point and we're going to fly back to get it. Um, and then shop calls me and they're like, I don't know what you did, but the whole car came on. I'm like, I didn't do anything to it. Like, I have no idea why it's working right now. So I called the customer to come get it. And the following day, it went back to being dead. So oh, no. <laughs> at that point, like, I know that something weird is going on with it. And I didn't want to look at it anymore. So I told them, I says, here's the deal. The only way we're going to even get anywhere with this car is I need to talk with the customer. The fact that it came on and now it's off tells me something funny is going on. And there had been so many hands in it that I didn't know what each shop had done on the way up. So that was the other reason. When a car gets like that, I'm out. I don't touch it at all. Like I'm done. Smart. But because of this scenario, like the people either had to buy a car or like get rid of this car somewhere down here. So it's kind of a Hail Mary. I called the customer directly and I said, I need to know you know a how did this all happen tell me step by step what you did and how this happened so they told me they were filling the car up with gas when in the gas station came back out the car was dead I said, okay that doesn't really help me i says in the time that you've owned this car is there any problems with the car that you can think of has it ever had a dead battery has anybody ever jumped it do any of the windows not work do the brakes squeak i said i don't care what it is do a does does a button not work? Does the dash rattle? Anything. And then any previous repairs that I just want to know anything. And they go, yeah, the sunroof doesn't close. And I go, what do you mean the sunroof doesn't close? And they're like, the sunroof hasn't closed in years. It's stuck in the open <laughs> position, like tilted. And I'm like, as soon as I heard that, like I'm at the shop at this point, I'm just sitting there with the car. So I had driven back there to get the customer's phone number. I immediately slide open the sunroof. That's the shade is closed on. And there's a garbage bag stuffed up in there. And I'm like, I know exactly what's wrong at this point. So anytime a sunroof leaks or a sunroof stays open, the drains get clogged or the water runs in and gets something wet. Well, it's been open forever and it's just running. Anytime it rains, it's running through there. So I says to him, I says, by chance, was it raining when you were you know, driving back on the day that it died? And they're like, yeah, it was raining the whole time. And when we got to the gas station, you know, that's when it showed off. I'm like, well, obviously water got someplace from this sunroof that's, you know, stuck open. So I says to the shop, I says, well, the drains run into the kick panels. I says, pull the kick panels out just in the footwells and look down in there. Like we pulled the kick panels out while I'm standing there. All the connectors are full of corrosion and the RFA module, we literally dunk water out of. I'm like, okay, we're done. We know what's wrong with it. Order an RFA module, clean all the connectors. Order an RFA module, leave the old BCM in it and clean everything. And I went back out and programmed it. Car comes on, everything's fine, car is fixed. Now, I literally, the car never would have gotten fixed, at least not by me, because I wasn't going to spend any time on it. So that was like a perfect example of call the customer. And there was no like crib sheet I went off of. I just wanted to know everything in the past. And because that came up, you know, we were able to fix the car, but without that knowledge of you know, that going on, there's no way I would have ever fixed the car or that shop would have ever fixed the car. And that car probably would have gotten traded in. Um, and that's a good example too, of like, I don't normally get that heavily involved. I only did with this one for the mere fact that the people were stranded. It's just like, a, it, was a, it was a flood vehicle at that point. Yeah. Yep. Wow. So you, one, you said you walked away from it and you kept getting drawn back in. So technically you still fixed it. Yeah. 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 Eventually once we knew that, like I had never made, that was the, I guess, beauty of this is I never made a call on the car of, I think this is what it needs to fix it. Like there was none of that. I was never even going to take a shot at it. And to be completely honest, that's why my misdiagnosed list stays fairly short. You know, if I 
get a phone call. The perfect example is used car dealers. I get a phone call. I only have two used car dealers out of a hundred customers. Um, that's it. That's all I deal with. There's, I don't deal with the rest of them because typically they cause, they don't cause issues. They get an auction car that they have no background on. That had so issues. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like a, you know, fifth owner BMW that somebody's put an engine in now and it's got a different DME and it has all these weird problems and they call and they're like, yeah, we have all these codes and it misfires and all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm not touching it. Like, Sounds what do you like mean, hell right? on earth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like, I don't even get involved in that stuff. If it's anything old, uh, starting January 1st, we're not going to touch anything beyond 15 years old. We've had too many issues during COVID. We had started a massive issue with, cars coming out of like fields and stuff and going to auction and then you have no background info on them so it's got to a point where you just can't spend that amount of time on them and matt's gonna know this one exactly uh that i'm gonna bring up is this number three struck no no oh, okay. uh, All right. it's just a different i guess kind of topic instructors coming into a class and saying there's no such thing as an unfixable car well, there's certainly such thing as an unfixable car as far as money and time goes. You know, it's not, Matt and I both know several instructors that make this statement constantly in class. And it's like, no, nah, in the real world, there's certainly unfixable cars. And also not only cars that, you know, everything can be diagnosed with enough time, but there is cars that will potentially not be able to be fixed. Parts are discontinued. It has the wrong engine in it. Now I've had three cars this year with the wrong engine in it from that somebody put an engine in and then it made it to auction. And then it has a weird issue and I get called out. And like the last one was a Dodge Caravan. They had thrown parts at it for, I don't know, three months. And I went out and I'm like, this has the wrong engine in it. Like I opened the hood and realized that there was an EGR uh, pipe that was pinched off. And I'm like, somebody switched an engine in this. And I went into the shop and like, what do we know about this? Oh, well, such and such customer has it now. It came from this place. I'm like, call all, call everybody that's touched this car. I need to know if it has a different engine in it. Finally, you know, nobody really would say, and I just looked at the cam and crank correlation and compared it to what it was supposed to have, and it's got the wrong engine in it. So, like, just dumb things like that have caused me to not want to touch old stuff this year. Um, so, again, that's why I only have three. I set myself up for success, not for failure. Or they have the wrong module in. <clears throat> yeah, somebody plugged in a got a used module and it's wrong. And yeah. if you don't know about it, I mean it's it's a rabbit hole. You can't. I don't see how you get out of it. That's yeah. you have to follow your the, what I find to be a logical process until you've burnt up the reasonable repairs and now you're left with well, this could you know somebody plugged in. A used mod, like you have to come to that conclusion yourself because nobody's yeah. going to tell you and say, Oh, yeah, you know, a few weeks ago or months ago, we had an ABS light on. We, you know, new mo new ABS pump module is, you know, three thousand dollars. And I, I bought the car for two thousand. <laughs> yeah. And, and so they went to the salvage yard, and the salvage yard probably just said it's got to get programmed and they plugged it in, and the ABS light went off. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but maybe other lights went on or, you know, other scenarios where maybe the car doesn't work at all, start at all. But usually it's, you know, something weird like that and they'll never tell you. And you end up coming to this weird conclusion. Uh, I, I probably shouldn't mention it because I don't know the details, but it reminds me of a vehicle uh, Thornton, John ran into that he was thinking it was the wrong motor, but they didn't replace the motor. They replaced, I think it's on a Chevy, um, the intake cam and per RPO, it was the right cam. No, oh, okay, no, let me rephrase. They did replace the engine. They did, they replaced the engine with a new engine from General Motors. It was the proper RPO. They put it in, it never ran right. And he figured out that there is a running change on the intake cam, same RPO code. That's, That's not confusing. <laughs> the, that Aveo that Bryn had, that somebody had put a head on, and that had the wrong cam on it. And that was a Motor Age article. And that was the right head with the wrong 
part in it. And once somebody yeah. starts changing that stuff, I mean, you're screwed. Somebody's going to get, I had a van uh, this year. I didn't screw it up. I was kind of involved in figuring out what went wrong afterwards. Um, one of the used car dealers that I do with screwed it up. So they put a used PCM in a 11 caravan from 08 on with Chrysler's do not install any used module at all. Um, and pretty much for every vehicle at that point, th there's some exceptions to that, but most of the modules are VIN locked at this point. And if you plug certain modules in, so like on a Chrysler, the TIPM, the totally integrated power module gets its VIN from the PCM. So when they plug the used PCM in and rolled the key, it immediately wrote the VIN from the PCM into the TIPM. Well, and there's several modules that get it, its VIN from the TIPM, so then it rewrote the wrong VIN in several other modules. So when they called me, they're like, this thing started. No, it doesn't start. It should have never started. So that still stumped all of us. But at any rate, now it doesn't start, and it has all these weird codes in it. So I went out there and rewrote the VIN. You can't write the VIN with factory software. It has to be done with an aftermarket tool on a Chrysler. So I rewrote the VIN in the PCM. The TIPM cannot have the VIN rewritten regardless without a, another software that's like a, I don't know, <laughs> I want to explain that software on here, but at any rate, right. so I plugged that's into the TIPM. Hole. Yeah, I, I fixed the VIN in the TIPM, I fixed the VIN in the PCM, um, I think I had fixed the VIN in the ABS module, but there were several modules that I could not fix the VIN in that were just stuck and now it has codes in like those three modules for the incorrect VIN. And even though I had fixed the VIN in the other ones, basically there's like two VIN slots and one stays empty. And once that second VIN slot is filled by another VIN, that's it. Now they're junk. So the airbag light was on and some other stuff. And he's like, well, now what do I do? I'm like, uh, unless you want to replace like $3,000 worth of modules, you can take it to the auction. So he took it to the auction and now that's going to run around the auction and somebody's going to be screwed because they're not going to know why it has VIN mismatch codes, knowing that now it has the correct VIN in all the other stuff. So if it's somebody like Matt and I that, you know, we hear these stories with all the rest of the guys that go through this, we know that that's what goes on. But if that goes to a regular shop, they're going to have no idea why it has been mismatched codes because all the VINs match and they're not going to know whether they should replace those modules or what they should do with it. Yep. The fun of buying a vehicle from an auction, uh, like that's going to be, uh, that's going to be trouble for somebody. Yeah. So it's just not a, you know, there's certain things that are just not really friendly when it comes to that, when it comes to computer logic. Uh, that are going to be, you know, and that's going to lead to somebody probably that's going to get misdiagnosed at some point, you know, granted, if they just call a module on it and they put a module on it, then yeah, it's going to fix it. Cause it's just a module issue at this point. It's a module logic problem or, you know, coding problem at that point, but it's certainly going to throw somebody because there's not any service information on that either. That's the other side of this is, you know, sometimes we have an issue with service information, which oddly enough, this is the, Next and last one I have that's a service information problem, so we'll go over that in just a second. But if there's missing service information, you're not going to be able to diagnose it either unless you have somebody that you can call and say, hey, why does this happen or why is this like this? Then you'll be okay. Um, but if not, you can certainly misdiagnose it like this next one. And number three, I, I, I don't know if we have a drum roll or not, but uh, <laughs> number three... Number three, yep, number three misdiagnosis is a 09 Buick Lucerne, uh, no blower motor operation. So this one was should have been pretty simple, uh, partially my fault because I was in a hurry, partially problem of service information. So basically it sends 12 volts to the blower motor to turn it on, and then the second wire is a pulsed ground and that comes from a blower control module and the blower control module gets its signal from the HVAC control module. So I went to it and I had a 12 volt feed to the motor like I was supposed to, but I had no control to uh, the blower motor. So in my infinite wisdom of stupidity, 
I just quick hooked on to it's a pulsed ground signal or pulse with duty cycle signal to that. Uh, I have a tool that can provide that signal. So I just hooked up to the wire and provided the signal to it and it turned on. So I'm like, okay, cool. Blower motor is fine. Uh, the blower motor module had already been replaced on this by the shop. And it basically came from the HVAC control head and then just went through the module. So I had to have it at the module from the control head. And I not only did I not have it out of the module, but I didn't have it from the HVAC control head. So I went to the module, hooked my tool up there and pulsed it going into the module, which then also turned on the fan. So at this point, the module's good. And the circuit from the uh, blower control module to the fan is good. So I'm like, all right, cool. It needs an HVAC control head. Uh, the wire goes from there to the control head. Fine. I quick just pulled the control head, looked at the back of it. You know, no issue there. And I just stuck it back in. I'm like, all right, yeah, that's what it needs. I look at a diagram. It's just a wire from the control head to the blower module. That's all it is. So I didn't test that wire. And that was where I went wrong. Um, but once I <laughs> they put a... Uh, blower control module in it, or not blower control module, HVAC module, so the actual head, I said, you know, that should fix it. They put it in, it didn't fix it. So then I go back out, and at that point, I'm like, well, I already know the circuit from the blower control module, which is under the dash, from there to the blower is good, because I had tested it by hooking up to the control module, but I hadn't done it up at the HVAC control head. So I went up there, hooked it up up there and of course it no longer turns it on and I then just voltage drop measurement between the module and the HVAC module and realize that I have a wiring issue between there and then I go look on a OEM diagram instead of an aftermarket diagram and realize that there's a connector in line so the aftermarket diagrams a lot of times don't show connectors um, like so often it's insane, especially with network things. So many of the times splice packs aren't shown on there. Um, connectors that go through kick panels aren't shown on there. So this one didn't show a connector. Uh, the OEM diagram did. I, of course, go anytime there's a connector, you know that that's what you want to check first. I look at the diagram, find the connector, go to unplug the connector. It's right underneath an evaporator drain that's missing and it has full of water and corroded and unplugged it. And of course the pins all fall out and it's all broken. <laughs> so that, that was my, you know, I was in a hurry and I didn't test there, but also service information completely threw me for a loop. And I misdiagnosed, this is years ago, a mini for the same thing. A mini showed a power wire that went out to the coils. I would lose power to the coils when it got hot. And it showed that they went directly from the coils to the DME. And that was it, that there was nothing in between that. Well, that wasn't true. It went through the front end control module and the plug was all corroded in the front end control module. So, you know, it just dumb things with service information, I guess, and me not checking an OEM versus an aftermarket diagram. Now, typically I always use an OEM diagram to prevent that, but certainly not all the time. Yep. So those are the three. That, that last one, I could totally see how that could happen. Uh, and especially if you don't know if there's a splice somewhere uh, or, you know, any type of connection point I, that I, I don't put you at fault there. Like, I, I don't know. Like, did you beat yourself up over it? Uh, not really. Not at this point anymore. I mean, I look at so many cars. I was just looking the other day, my uh, car list for the year is 275 as of yesterday. So, that's some people are gonna be like that's all he does but that's i only do mobile diagnostics and programming and that's only let's see wednesday friday and sometimes monday and then on tuesdays and thursdays maybe one in the morning because of webinars and other projects that we do so we only have a few days a week that we're actually like able to do stuff so granted that's also programming and diagnostics but you know that's still when you look at it, when a shop looks at the amount of cars they do, I bring up how much mechanical work versus diagnostic work are you doing? There's shops that I thought, well, Matt knows Matt's a manager of a shop. How much, how many cars a month do you think you do that are mechanical versus diagnostics? 
the shop itself. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm the only one that really does any of the diag. So out of, you know, roughly 150 cars a month, uh, you know, really maybe 36 of them roughly. Right. Well, let's just say 30 to 40. I think it would be a fairly safe bet our diag. And that's no, not programming or ADOS or anything like that. Strictly figure this out. And, and speaking specifically of like electrical drivability type failures. Right. Um, so yeah, yeah, I would say, you know, out of four techs, 25% or <laughs> yeah. whatever. Right? Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, a shop sees, you know, significantly less as far as, uh, that stuff goes so you know and that's because the other thing. I, my shop might be a horrible example true <laughs> true versus so like i guess where i'm going with that is you know because i that's all i do i expect to have misdiagnosis just like a shop would expect to bolt a mechanical part on uh, brake pads you put a set of brake pads on and they squeak you know you know that that's going to happen fairly you know hopefully not fairly consistently but anytime a line changes or something or you're going to put a component on maybe it was a um part that was i don't want to say cheap but subpar there was some issue with it and you have a comeback because of that you know for somebody that that's all they do is diagnostics and programming like me i expect to, to have that stuff so i don't really beat myself up i think in the you know, early stages I would. Now it's kind of like, yeah, whatever. I don't care. Yeah. And, and worst case scenario, I go, if I gotta give somebody money back, then so be it. Typically, I just go out and diagnose it the second time uh, for free. And all of my shops are good friends of mine. I help all of them over the phone too. I bail those guys out constantly. Uh, so you know, there's not really ever any hard feelings about it. And people are like, well, what if you, you know, the Duramax that you put in an eight hundred dollar module? so be it you know eight hundred dollars in the grand scheme of things for something like that i don't want to say it's chump change i know some people right. feel it that way but you know a we have insurance for a reason which we could use for that but we don't really don't but that's also just like if realistically the shop can't return it and they wanted us to pay for it then it really wouldn't matter to me it's a you're, i'm paying for a learning experience at that point cost of doing business yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Huh. i'm All jealous right. i'm jealous of tanner because i constantly beat myself up <laughs> i think cars, most texts do right there's like cars I, I misdiagnosed in my when i first got in and i if i think about it i'll just like start slamming my head against the table like you <laughs> idiot or yeah, these cars he, i couldn't figure out like oh if i could just have them back i bet yeah, i could figure it out now he was beating himself up last week talk yeah. about that one your one that your one? uh van your vantage pro <laughs> Was that yeah, good? so I kind of knew it. I think everybody, if you present the symptoms, kind of has an idea what's wrong with this car, but it's a Ford Flex and the hazards lights don't go off. The rear hatch will open and close on its own. The brake fluid level warning light is on. And I think most people, most techs, even somewhat familiar, are already very suspicious of one component, the, the body control module or the smart junction block, box down on the left kick panel area. It turns out it's actually really, really easy to replace. I could do it. So, but, and, and that's my testing now. I'm getting, I'm testing to prove what I think is already wrong and, and, and let things take their way uh, to that. You know, I'm not trying to force the issue and make an assumption. Although I would have been better off making the assumption in this case, because it turns out of all things, my Vantage Pro has a very intermittent connection internally. So I haven't pulled it apart to see about fixing it, or maybe we'll send it in. I've got three more backups, um, just because I figure at some point they're going to break and there's no buying new ones. And yeah, they're not the made it. Current anymore. offerings yeah. are not worth buying. So anyways, it leads me the opposite direction. It's not the su smart junction box. It's the, um, the, uh, uh, not the, a is it APM? The, APM, yep. Yeah, so it's a the hazard switch, the radio controls, the uh, HVAC controls, that thing. 
And it's like, wow, that's weird. Okay, so put it in, same problem. Like, what? Go back, do my testing again. Like, I got a bad, another bad one of these. And I don't know what possessed me to do it, right? Because I make assumptions. I'm bad about making assumptions. But I decide to go on a known circuit that's working with the vPro and it does not give me the results I expect. And then I go and I just hook it up to the battery and it's like, holy crap, it's not even reading 12 volts. And I <laughs> kind of took it and hit it, bounced it off the um, you know front of the car a few times and I got spikes of 12 volts. And it's like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you have to be kidding me. So I go grab another vPro and then I get the results we all would have expected. And it's a bad... Uh, smart junction <laughs> box and I got to call the customer like I really screwed up uh, my test equipment failed me and I, you know when he came to pick up the car I showed him like why like I, you know I, I'm just not in the habit of verifying my equipment every test yeah <laughs> and maybe I will be now <laughs> from now on it just you know I thought maybe it was a bad test lead and I Check yeah, we've all had that on those, yeah. God, you know, just, yeah, there's that. There's a, um, he was talking about, uh, the, your, your, I think your last one. And a lot of times, I don't, not a lot, but more, far too often I'll get lazy. <clears throat> far too often. It, it's really pathetic. Um, sometimes on the Ford pickups, uh, maybe mid 2000s or so the um, brake level warning light will be on. And the first one I ran into, I went over to the master cylinder and I smashed it with my fist and the light went out. So I was like, done deal. <laughs> get a get a brake fluid level switch in there, slam it in there, the light's out, drive it, it's good. Customer's back the next day. I'm like, really? <laughs> All right, well, watch the light. Okay, smash the master cylinder again, goes out. Like, like a bad switch that's that's really weird okay yeah, is that even really possible i mean come on so then i do a little bit of testing and no no it's the instrument cluster and and specifically in this one it wasn't in the cluster although that is an issue it's the connection uh the pin terminal tension on top uh, of the main plug-in goes bad and you have to retension the terminal or replace the terminal, and that's what fixes it. So what I was doing is when I was smashing the master cylinder, I was just shaking everything inside enough to make a connection and turn the light out. He just Hulk smashed it and shook the whole truck in it. Yeah, <laughs> the front tires kind of go flat and it bounces. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> shut the, the hood and it's good. Yeah, yeah. well, yep. and the fawns hit. Yeah. Well, this is we're up on our hour. Um, I did want to ask maybe one last bit of advice from the conversation that we had, right? And one of the things that I took out of it, and I'm curious to see maybe what you would say to the audience is uh, the importance in asking good questions, right? Because yep. it, if, if you can ask good questions and then keep asking follow-up questions to try and get to the root of something, whether it's from the, the shop's perspective or once you're in diagnosing something, you know, why is this doing this? Why is this doing this? And being able to do that, I think there's a, a lot of impact in that. But curious to advice that the two of you might have for those techs that are listening right now as to maybe how to how to get around some of this stuff. Uh, be more like Tanner. For be more like, do we, is there, is there <laughs> a t-shirt? Like it me. sounds yeah. somewhat sarcastic, is, but... Is there t-shirts that say that, Matt? There should be. What would be Tanner like, do? Yeah. Huh? Be, not, not, not be like Mike, second Michael Jordan be reference like today. Be like Tanner. I like yeah. it. We should get uh, those t-shirts done. That probably should... sounds very sarcastic, but I, I really do mean it because at some point, all the self-loathing does nothing. You're better yeah. off to just extract what you need to extract and learn from it and, and move on and become better because of it. The constant beating yourself up like it's really not productive at all um and there's no reason to keep you know start running yourself in the ground if you keep making the same mistakes over and over then then maybe you need to start um, beating yourself up but I, I, honestly just take away you know just analyze the situation 
and uh, take away what you need. And um, maybe, you know, there's something to be learned from uh, if you watch some, the old chess master program, uh, you could, so if, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie um, Searching for Bobby Fischer. There's a kid that is based off of Josh Waitzkin, and he was an extremely strong chess player uh, for the longest time, almost bringing up uh, people talking about him as being the next Bobby Fischer. And he, he talks about chess as you have ideas and you start to execute your ideas. Well, diagnostics is the same thing. You have an idea of what could be wrong. These are the heavy hitters of what could be the cause. And I'm going to ask these questions. I'm going to make these tests in chess. I'm going to make these moves to execute this idea to, you know, checkmate my opponent. And how will they react? How these tests come back dictate how I respond. So you can't be so regimented in your moves. You can't sit and watch a bunch of games by some, you know, chess engine alpha zero or anything like that and just move the pieces regardless of what the other side does. You have to remain something, I'm pretty sure I'm getting this right. You have to remain something called prophylactic and you have to be able to be flexible in changing your ideas. This, this line is, of attack is not going to work anymore. I have to change and move over to this other side and I have to plan for that almost. And that is part of a diagnostic process is the results have to dictate what I'm going to do. I can't get so regimented in what I think is going to be wrong, which should lead me to talking about a car but I know we're trying to wrap this up, but there's a Mini <laughs> Cooper. There's a Mini Cooper I misdiagnosed the crap out of. It was horrible. The only thing that made it okay was we didn't actually bolt the part on there, but I was, I had it in my head. It had to be a turbo. It had to be. And it's A, really not like me, but it's exactly what happened. And I could not get away from it. And, you know, I called a turbo. Luckily, they didn't have the work done they didn't they took it somewhere for second uh opinion but they didn't diagnose it either and through social media uh i learned where i should have been going uh with this vehicle and i called and begged for the car back and uh it ended up being it was a cam timing issue the camp the timing chain was stretched to hell and there was a couple of clues that way um not you know, you blow codes out of it, it, would not set cam timing codes right away. If they drove it for a while, it would set boost codes like crazy. But if they drove it long enough, it would come back with cam correlation codes. And that was the clue. Um, but I blew codes out of it and drove it, had no boost and no cam timing codes. So I was, I just got really stuck. Uh, and so learning from that, remain flexible. You know, test, test, test needs to take you, um, in a different direction, change your ideas. Don't get regimented. That's that's great. That's yeah, great advice. That last clip was just awesome. The whole thing, Tanner. Do you have anything to add? Yeah. So Matt brought up looking on Facebook and stuff. There's your network is one of the biggest things that's going to help you for things like that. So I'm sure uh, I'm going to guess here, but that probably was learned from like Justin or somebody like that who had seen it <laughs> actually uh the customer whoever they took it to had a friend that they called and sent copies of the invoice uh, or estimate sorry estimate to and they posted it up on a facebook group for me to be lambasted at and <laughs> deservedly brutal. so to a point i just wish they would have taken the customer's name off of it and probably our shop's name uh and they could have maybe privated me like, Hey man, we're giving it to you. And I, yeah. <laughs> and I think I would have had it coming having the customer's name on there and the shop name, probably not that cool. And it got yeah. taken down. The administrators took it down right away. Um, but regardless, that's how I learned like, Oh, I'm, I'm think I'm way wrong. And now I have to reconsider. And then conversations with, um, Justin Morgan and, um, Dust Harris and a bunch yep. of people yep. just, yeah, dude. Cam but time so, is really common. Yeah. <laughs> but so having a network, because that specific car that Matt's talking about, the logic or the computer programming for code set criteria is written really poorly. Um, so cam timing will cause all kinds of dumb issues on that car. You can have mass airflow codes, you can have no boost codes, like all these different things that 
this is a BMW problem in my opinion, um, that it's just poorly written information. So you have no way to know that. So you have to have a good network because you're not gonna find in their service information that, hey, these codes, unless there's a service wolf, and sometimes there is, that, hey, these random codes that have nothing to do with you know, your actual problem could set. You'll go into like code set criteria and they always give like possible causes and service information. And they never took into account that cam timing would cause it. So the only way you're gonna know that is to have a network of people to call. So I would say definitely step one is, you know, have a network, don't be afraid to ask questions uh, to other people. Kind of more or less put your ego on hold and say, hey, I don't know, I need to call. Uh, also set yourself up for success, not failure. Don't, uh, the same thing with the ego. When a customer calls and they're like, this car has been to 10 different shops, everyone, don't just be like, yeah, I'll do it. They're, you know, they didn't know I'm going to be the hero. Nine out of 10 times Puff if you're that, that person. Yeah. yeah. Nine out of 10 times if you're that person, you are setting yourself up for failure because that car has been touched at every single shop. It has different parts on it now from every shop. It could have... We talked about modules. It could have used modules now installed, and then you're going to spend weeks chasing the problems that were caused from the other shops before you even get to what the actual concern was. And the customer is likely going to run out of money before that point, or you're just going to be like, I have to fix this. You know, I have to be the one that fixes it. You're not going to make any money off of it in the end, anyways. Now, I'm not giving a business coaching seminar here, but there's no point in going through that from a business perspective or from just a time perspective. Sanity, and sanity, bingo. general sanity yes. perspective. <laughs> yep. So that would be my you know, biggest thing. Set yourself up for success, not failure. Um, make sure that you have a network that you're willing to talk with and bounce ideas off of. Uh, and then as far as talking with the customer, make sure that you ask a million different questions. The customer is probably going to lie to you, but if you can find out past service, if you can find out past anything that they've ever had repaired, um, failures that are on the vehicle currently that they know about, even if it's just a rattle or a squeak, just things that they may not think are relevant, ask those questions too. Um, and then I would say also try your best not to get in a hurry. I mean, that's, you see with most of the stuff that I misdiagnosed both the you know, first two were simply I was in a hurry and didn't spend the time on them that I should have spent on it. And, you know, I would have been better off. Now, again, I want to just quick add two. I only had three. And I don't want people to think that that's like, oh, man, that's all he misdiagnosed a year. That all comes from that I set myself up for success. I don't take on dumb cars that I'm going to, you know, lose a battle on. It's not worth it. So if you do those things, you're going to be successful on anything that you diagnose. Well, guys, this is this has been a phenomenal podcast. I think this is great for maybe even those technicians out there that might be struggling with a problem right now uh, to be able to hear it. And it's just kind of a breath of fresh air to, to I think, be vulnerable and show that we're not perfect 100% of the time, right? Like there are times where we're, we're not spot on and, and not to beat yourself up. I love Matt's uh, comment there in terms of, of not beating yourself up too much and, and really uh, use it as learning, like be able to take that, comp compute it in your head and use that moving forward. I think you're going to be more successful as a result. So thanks to the both of you for joining me. It sounds like this might be an annual thing that we have to do just, uh, and, and Matt, maybe we'll get yours. It, it might, if, if we group all this together, it could be a really, really long podcast. So, yeah, yeah. uh, we'll, we'll just have to, uh, be to like share a telethon. Some <laughs> yeah. call in and donate old, money old school yeah yeah uh no but i i do appreciate the fact that both of you are so open to talk about uh maybe mistakes made along the way and and things that you've done to learn i i think this is great great content so appreciate the both of you thanks for having awesome. me awesome thank you